Welcome everybody uh, to the first session in our Just Transition Research Collaborative webinar series, Justice in Low Carbon Transitions. I'm Dunja Krause, Research Officer at the UN Research Institute for Social Development that hosts the JTRC. And uh, we have organized this webinar series as the JTRC with support from the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. Today's session kicks off our series that will take place over the coming two months and with which we would like to share some of our thinking and reflections on a range of aspects of just transitions that we feel are relevant in the current context. A context that is shaped by the urgent need for but lacking speed of decarbonization on the one hand and increasing levels of inequalities and injustice on the other. A context that has been shaken up quite significantly by the COVID-19 pandemic and its impacts on lives and livelihoods around the world that in a way has made a just transition and the departure from business as usual ever more urgent. With this series, we hope that we can stimulate interesting debate and contribute a diverse set of perspectives and evidence that can help advance justice in low carbon transitions. We will touch upon different aspects such as just transition and its history and relevance as a worker movement, questions of gender and just transition, financing just transition, the role of communities, and finally politics and power in a just transition moving forward. The theme of today's introduction to this series is framings and design politics of just transitions. And I'm really thrilled to be joined here today by an excellent group of panelists who will share some of their insights and ideas with us. After the first round of inputs, we will have time for questions and answers. But before we start, allow me to make some very brief announcements. The session is being recorded and also live streamed via YouTube, where it will remain available afterwards on the Unrest YouTube channel. You will see that we have enabled both a general chat box and a Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. Please use the Q&A box only for questions you would like to post directly to one or several of our speakers and put any general comments or information as well as your greetings that you have already been putting forward uh, into the general chat box. Um, for the questions you put into the Q&A box, you will also have a chance to vote for the different questions put forward, which will help us identify those questions that most people would like to see answered. So please do make um, use of that feature. At the very end of the webinar, we will also share a link to a very short three question feedback survey and would really appreciate if you could help us by answering that. But now first, uh, a brief introduction to our panelists. Um, I think I will just introduce them uh, one at a time as we move uh, through their presentation, starting with uh, Edouard Morena, who is a, ooh, sorry. Edouard Morena, who is a lecturer, lecturer in French studies and international politics at the University of London Institute in Paris, and who is pretty much the brain behind the entire JTRC uh, initiative and has uh, been engaged in it from the very start. So Edouard, over to you. Okay, hi, thanks. Uh, thanks, Dunia, for the introduction. Um, I should also say that um, the whole JTRC initiative is also lar largely uh, uh, the product of your efforts, uh, I have to say, and, and at the moment, I would say even more. Um, uh, but yes, yeah, so it's, it's more the product of a collaboration, I would say, between both of us. Uh, um, I guess what I will use my eight minutes uh, to talk about are, I mean, I, I guess I, I would like to touch upon kind of some of the underlying motives behind the JTRC. Um, and and um, why we feel that this kind of concept of just transition is uh, is such an important one, um, and also why we feel that it is worth um, collectively reflecting uh, on its origins and also on its potential uh, as uh, as a concept. Um, so I guess the just to come back to the history of the JTRC, uh, um, I mean it it was really uh, um, in 2018 uh, that this uh, that this project came about, and I guess the context uh, is particularly uh, important because it was in the lead up to the Katowice uh, Climate Conference in, in in December 2018, uh, a conference that was already uh, beginning to be kind of framed as the Just Transition Conference. Um, and I guess that also had to do with the fact with that uh, Katowice is in the heart of Polish coal country, uh, but also uh, the broader context, uh, the broader kind of geopolitical context, and also the fact that um, um, following uh, uh, Donald Trump's election in 2016 um, and his uh, uh, decision also to exit the, the, the Paris Accord, I mean, that raised a lot of debates and issues 
uh, in relation to uh, the importance of kind of the social and the justice elements uh, in the kind of low carbon transitions. Because, you know, as you are probably all aware, I mean, part of Trump's campaign was uh, explicitly targeted at uh, workers in the uh, Rust Belt, uh, but also in the coal mining regions of the United States. <clears throat> and it was also centered on this idea that effectively uh, um, uh, implementing a low carbon transition would imply the loss of jobs and the, the breakdown of these uh, communities. Um, and at the same time, in late 2018, I mean, there were also mobilizations that also highlighted the need to try and reflect uh, um, more on the kind of connections between uh, the issue of the, the transition, low carbon transition, and issues of, uh, of justice. Um, in, the, in France, where I'm based, uh, um, you know, as you are also probably aware, there was the Yellow Vest movement, which was directly connected with this issue uh, because it was uh, initially it was initiated uh, following the decision by the government to implement a, uh, um, a, a, a tax increase on petrol. And so this was disproportionately affecting uh, uh, um, working class uh, communities and families. And so uh, um, the, the time was definitely ripe to uh, reflect on uh, uh, what this term means and its potential. And, and that added, and the, maybe the final kind of motivation also had to do with the fact that the concept itself of just transition was being taken up, taken up by an increasingly broad array of uh, stakeholders in the climate uh, conversation, in particular at the international level. So the inclusion of the just transition wording in the Paris Climate Agreement of 2015, but also all that I've been explaining or presenting just now in terms of the kind of debates in societies and in various kind of national contexts, uh, um, led a number of uh, actors to actually take up the just transition concept uh, and to take an interest in many ways in this issue of uh, uh, justice and in particular uh, labor uh, justice in relation to uh, low carbon transitions. So I think it's a positive thing, I mean, that this uh, the reappropriation took place, but at the same time, and I think with Dunya and others, we're already seeing that it also, uh, uh, um, uh, there were also a series of challenges and even potential risks uh, uh, associated with this process of reappropriation uh, uh, um, um, of the concept of just transition. And amongst these risks was, also, was, was the risk of stripping the concept of its meaning and also its transformational uh, potential. So a first priority for us was really to try and focus on uh, um, re-grounding, uh, re you know, re-grounding the concept by retracing its origins, by really highlighting that the concept of just transition is not a concept that was imagined uh, at the international level by a small group of individuals. It's actually a concept that is rooted in struggles uh, um, in very uh, uh, specific uh, regions and in, during a very specific time, uh, namely uh, the United States in the 1970s through the efforts of people like Tony Mazzocchi and the Oil, Oil Chemical and Atomic Workers Union. Um, and so, I mean, for the trade union movement, uh, uh, especially, the trust transition concept is actually more than just about jobs. Uh, it's also actually about empowerment and organizing. And that's another thing we wanted to really uh, highlight. Uh, um, for those within the union movement, you know, the just transition, especially when you look at how it evolved and it, and it emerged and it kind of developed at the international level and eventually was included in the Paris Climate Agreement, it was really about getting workers to engage in the international climate conversation and actually in the climate conversation or environmental conversation more generally. So it played kind of an educating role within uh, the labor movement. And at the same time, it was also an instrument that enabled the labor movements to actually establish links and to get non-labor actors to also recognize the need to factor in labor-related uh, concerns. And so I guess what's important here to note is that it wasn't just, you know, the important thing was not just about including wording, including just transition in the Paris Agreement. It was also the whole process that led to the inclusion of this wording in the Paris Agreement, which is important and which is important to, to, to highlight. It's the years of campaigning, the years of complicated and difficult conversations, both within the labor movement itself 
and between the labor movement and other constituencies, women, indigenous groups, environmental organizations, uh, uh, among others. Uh, additionally, for a number of frontline groups, so not the international level, but on the ground, uh, um, um, the, the just transition concept is also important because it's a tool that they use at the local level uh, um, to actually establish and build links between multiple struggles and actually to bring about very concrete change at the local level. So I guess what I want to say here is that just transition, as we were, you know, in the con just transition is more than just an objective. Uh, uh, um, it is an, also a, an, an instrument, an instrument that helps, that has enabled a number of groups to raise awareness uh, about the kind of multiple dimensions of the low carbon transition, about the justice and the social justice dimensions in particular, but also to empower and to organize uh, groups. And as I say, this tended, we, our impression was that this tended to be lost in uh, the current parlance around just transition. It, we were seeing the just transition concept being used and reappropriated at the risk of transforming it into yet another buzzword in the international uh, uh, climate or environmental conversation. And as a result, the risk was also of emptying it of its transformational potential. Uh, by detaching it from the workers and the frontline communities who were actually at the origin of the concept itself, but also by associating it with a very narrow top-down uh, top set of demands, essentially just centered on this idea of shifting from gray or dirty jobs to green jobs, but without including all the other dimensions that I referred to uh, precedingly. And so when we launched, launched a Just Transition Research Collaborative, we felt that it was really important to begin by acknowledging where the concept comes from, retracing uh, its origins, and in a sense, rerouting the concept as well. And as a result, show that it is more than just a buzzword or a top-down concept, and also show that it is geographically rooted and time-specific, uh, 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 and that it is really uh, originated from within the labor movement and among uh, frontline communities. And, and I'll end it here, and that it is this very rootedness, in fact, that gives it its unique, its uniqueness, its unique power and almost subversive uh, potential. Uh, because, as I say, it is a concept which has the particularity of being firmly rooted in lived experiences and struggles, uh, um, which in a sense grants it this unique legitimacy and power. And what is more, and this also makes it such a unique concept, is that it is both rooted and at the same time a concept that is internationally recognized. The inclusion of the concept in the Paris Agreement uh, uh, means that this concept has also entered into common par parlance. Uh, um, and so I know very, a very few concepts, in fact, that, ha that have these kind of dual uh, uh, qualities. Um, being at the same time contained in an international climate agreement and international discussions, and at the same time mobilized and simultaneously being mobilized by local communities uh, uh, to guide their concrete, very real efforts on the ground. Um, and so it's in this sense, really, I feel, and I'll finish here, that uh, the just transition concept is a concept not only worth studying, but also worth fighting for, because it is a concept which has uh, a tremendous uh, potential. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Edouard, uh, for both this quite comprehensive overview and for finishing on this kind of activist notion of let's fight for just transition. Um, so you've given us uh, an introduction of where the JTRC kind of came from and what, why we deal with this concept and what we're looking at. Um, we're handing over now to Damien White, uh, who is a professor of sociology and environmental studies and the Dean of Liberal Arts at the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, to broaden it even up a little bit further and look at just transition from a design perspective. So Damien, uh, you are dealing with a concept that comes from the labor union. What does design have to do with it all? You're still on mute, Damien. Okay, thanks very much. Can you hear me? Just give me a thumbs up. Yep, very good. So absolutely delighted to be here. 
and um, you should be able to see my slides there. Is that correct? Not yet? Okay, sorry about that. Uh, let me just share my slides. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, so over the last few years, I've been trying to think about a terrain of engagement between the just transition and design. And I'd just like to talk a little bit about um, what I really like about the concept and the discourse of the just transition and what kind of draws me in building on Edward's um, observations. So I think one thing that really strikes me about the just transition is how it offers a kind of multi-scalar policy analysis of just energy transitions across many institutions national and transnational contexts so particularly at the moment in a in a situation where in the US we are very much steeped in a, a Green New Deal discussion that's that's tremendously important tremendously valuable but it does have a degree of methodological nationalism to use um, Eric Beck's term um, encompassing um, these the discussions about strategy and politics and the just transition I feel opens that up a little more. And building on Edward's observation, there's something really important, I think, in the way it has additionally um, centered environmental labor histories and caused us to rethink the history of environmentalisms across um, many spaces and places, as well as opening up alliances between a labor and the potential for broader alliances as Edwards mentioned. Um, just mention a, a third issue that I think is really important, which I, I got from a, a fantastic paper written by Dimitri Stevis and Romani Feli that's just come out um, in 2020 about planetary global, tra uh, planetary just transitions. And they really, um, it was such a good paper. I just remember reading it uh, two weeks ago and thinking uh, it really captured all the things that I found fascinating about just transition. Notably, they emphasize what a complexifying discourse it is and the extent to which, you know, just transitions doesn't necessarily narrate a happy story, a simple story, a binary story in the ways that perhaps the degrowth growth eco mod debate has fallen into over the last number of years in that Dimitri and Feli um, uh, sorry um, Stevis and Feli emphasize you know the antagonistic qualities of just transitions the manner in which you know they're, uh, they're characterized by winners and losers conflicting outcomes um, they don't necessarily all play out or land in a kind of happy way and then in the really important book by um, by Edouard Dunya and uh, Dimitri, there's a constant emphasis on how this um, concept has come out through struggle, through campaigning. So, so these are the good things about the just transition, but there are certain limitations of just transition discourse at the moment. Most notably, it can be quite energy and carbon reductionist. It's not entirely clear how planetary it is. It can be more prescriptive than uh, descriptive than prescriptive, typological than speculative. And it can leave a range of areas which are very important for decarbonisation um, undeveloped, notably culture, socio-technical issues, aesthetics, culture. And this is really the realm of design. So over the last um, couple of years, I've been trying to think about a terrain of engagement with design. And I'll just um, flag up very quickly in bite-sized ways for the content of four papers that I've been working on that I can send you if you're interested, anyone out there. So the first paper really is trying to establish the kind of terrain of engagement between just transitions and design. And it's really trying to think about the ways in which that policy and protest shifts alone are absolutely central for producing just transitions. But just transitions will also have to be imagined and fabricated, realized, coded and created. And this is going to involve the channeling of enormous amounts of creative labor and inventive praxis. So this is the kind of a, the initial kind of bid that I'm going to make to um, uh, make the argument that design and designing needs to be central. And in one of the first papers I wrote, I really tried to um, think about the potential relationship or a horizon of engagement between histories of ecological design and just transitions and I tried to explore what these um, potentialities might be for moving a kind of material politics and then also thinking about the ways in which design is very linked to speculative futuring and could this open up a kind of transition futuring for just transitions through an engagement with the speculative qualities of design and architecture 
because to design is to prefigure. And it opens up a whole range of possible uh, opportunities for engagement. The second set of papers, though, that I've been reflecting on is really to think about how whilst critical design, transition design, ecological design, design for sustainability are all critically important areas, so much creativity gone into these areas over the last 20 years or more, there's some significant gaps which are revealed through reading design through a just transition lens. Notably, there's a kind of institutional gap, there's a political economy gap, there's a scalar gap, there are questions of expert lay relationships between the designers and publics, there's questions about the extent to which the very strong commitment of ecological design over the last um, 20 years ago to, to localist experiment, small is beautiful, etc., really is dealing with the scale of the crisis and the kind of institutional forces that are going to be needed to move design on in meaningful ways. So, so th that's one issue with ecological design. And a second issue I think that is really pressing is the way in which a lot of ecological design has become so communitarian in its focus that the knowledge power and and focus of workers and labor struggles has largely gone missing. So this leads us then to, well, where will we go to think about modes of design that, you know, could actually address sustainability, just transitions and labor? And in a paper I've just finished, I've tried to suggest that look, there are whole traditions of design where labor and ecology and design were seen as intimately related. We could go to William Morris, who tried to envisage a factory as it might be, that would be labor enhancing and sustainable. We might also go to figures like Ebenezer Howard and his vision of garden cities, which try to think of not just urban planning changes, but changes in the workplace in terms of the cooperative workplace. We might look at experiments in the 1970s and 80s around participatory planning that were very important in Britain, Chile and Scandinavia. Um, we might look at um, various Sorry, I'm flipping through here. Histories of socialist feminist design, which try to re reset the domestic sphere, the city, the urban space, um, attending to equity, equality and public health. And then most recently, there's been a, a torrent of really interesting literature around uh, the invisible labour of race and uh, indigeneity in reshaping our landscapes and being rendered invisible and needing to be present. So I'll just really finish up by saying that um, I think um, design, planning, architecture, broadly conceptualised, um, presses uh, the potential for a material politics for just transitions. At the same time, though, just transitions uh, discourse can really press important questions to design in thinking about its polit political economic gaps, its institutional gaps, and questions around power principally designed by whom um, by what social ecological impacts and modes of displacement whose labors present in de designs for decarbonization how are ecologies envisaged in terms of ecological designs how is scale understood and how do we think about a kind of multi-scalar complexifying engagement between design and decarbonisation? And could this move us beyond some of the standoffs that exist in many of our discussions at the moment? So I think I'll leave it there. And um, thanks very much. Thank you, Damien, also for the excellent timekeeping of our speakers so far. Um, so what we have heard is a just transition basically as a concept that comes from the grounds, from struggle, from the labor movement directly, um, and that has made it all the way to international negotiations and platforms um, and has been reappropriated and shaped in many different ways. Um, so we're really excited now to have with us today Ana Sanchez from the International Labor Organization, where she is the Regional Green Job Specialist for Latin, and Ameri uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, um, who can share with us some of the insights of uh, how Just Transition informs some of the work in the Latin America and Caribbean, and also some fairly concrete policy responses uh, on the ground. Uh, Damien, can I just ask you to mute yourself again, please? And then, Anna, the floor is yours.
Anna, you're still on mute. Can you hear me? It's okay? Good. Because I... So many of them, we use all these platforms, but still, there are some issues that don't work well. Uh, so, um, you are already uh, watching my presentation. Also, I'm not able to do it now. It's working now. Good. Let me see. Good. So, what I'm, what I'm going to do is to present a little bit what's happening on green jobs and just transition with a very special focus on informal economy in the region where I'm covering now, which is Latin America and the Caribbean. So as, as Dunya was saying, I'm working based in Mexico City uh, for the region, uh, for the ILO, the International Labor Organization, on the, I'm, I'm part of the Green Jobs Program. So maybe let's start with a little bit of a reminder why it's important to work on this issue of green jobs and just transition, and why it's important specifically for the LAC, for the Latin America and the Caribbean region. Oh, here you have a few examples about how environmental impacts and the world of work are, uh, are linked together. Uh, and in many times are not linked in a very positive way. Like you have here some, some uh, numbers about, air about uh, impacts in productivity of workplaces and companies of air pollution, of climate change, how loss of biodiversity and damage of ecosystems are uh, destroying jobs already, uh, natural disasters as well. Um, we need to take that into account. Uh, so just to, to go for a few numbers, if you see the text below the picture, you will see that only in Mexico and Central America, uh, we could have around 4 million climate migrants. And this is happening already. The picture that is, not, there, is, uh, is uh, there included is from a very recent um, um, movement from people from Central America to Mexico, they want to go to the United States and I guess all of you are very much aware about the problems that we are having with this issue now with migration and, and, and the, the very difficulties that uh, these populations are encountering when moving to other countries. And what we are saying and what we are uh, understanding is that uh, many of these uh, migration mi Migrant, migrants and migration movements are very much linked to climate change because El Salvador, Guatemala, and, and some of the countries that are part of the dry corridor, for example, they are having a great, a great loss of agriculture outputs. And since many of the livelihoods uh, they have depend on that particular sector, they simply, I mean, the disaster come, the drought come, the temperature rise, and the and, and the productivity simply is lost, and I mean the production is lost. And what they can do, the only option they have is is, is to move to other country and find try to find another job. So this is uh, this, probably this is going to be uh, increasing in the time because uh, greenhouse gas emissions are increasing. And uh, it's not only climate change, but we also have loss of biodiversity, and we also have other issues like natural disasters. So something that we have in Latin America, that is also common in Asia and in Africa, not that much in Europe, is that uh, a very important part of the population of Latin America are, are not part of the formal economy. So they are informal workers, they are informal business. What does it mean? It does mean that they don't have access uh, in many countries to any kind of social protection mechanism. They don't, workers don't have a contract with their employers. So there, there are no pension for them when they finish uh, the work. Uh, they, there, there is no health insurance for them, etc. And this is a big problem because uh, we will see that all these impacts uh, affect those most vulnerable who are exactly those working in the formal economy. This is the very, recent, very recently launched ILO Climate Action for Jobs Initiative. Uh, we launched it um, a few, well, two weeks ago, actually. But uh, we had a very important event with the Secretary General of the United Nations and our Director General and, and a few others uh, at the COP25 in Madrid. Um, what we are doing is to uh, put together uh, these, uh, all those countries who want to work on just transition 
following the guidelines for a just transition towards environmentally sustainable economies and societies, the image that you have at your right hand side, that was uh, adopted by the ILO uh, a few years back, 2015, at the same time when just transition was included in the Paris Agreement. So the main goals of this initiative are enable climate action with decent work and social justice. So as, as you know, for the ILO, the reason why we are working on environmental uh, and the environmental dimension, the environmental arena, is because we want uh, to push for decent work and social justice. Uh, the second goal is support countries in a transition that is just and funded in broad-based broad support. For us, uh, social dialogue is fundamental. And the third element is facilitate an, an inclusive recovery from COVID-19. Now I'm going to present uh, the main findings of our research that we did together with the Inter-American Development Bank and we launched uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and what we did was to uh, assess the job impacts of a uh, decarbonization process for Latin America and the Caribbean. And here you have uh, some of the important conclusions. First of all, it's positive for employment. So the fact that countries in Latin America and the Caribbean go uh, net zero, they don't produce uh, greenhouse gas emissions, it's positive for employment, okay? So uh, we can create 15 million new jobs, but uh, that that uh, we have to take into account that will be some sectors where uh, job creation will be positive, like you have in the right hand side, the red, uh, the red picture, you have agriculture and uh, base plant foods, for example, those are the, the sectors that uh, will be winner, you want, will grow. Also forestry and, as well, and, and of course, renewable electricity, but uh, there will be some other sectors uh, where those, I mean, jobs will probably be destroyed because they are, those jobs are part of a sector that need to, to, to change simply, need to adapt. Uh, which are those sectors? Fossil fuel electricity, fossil fuel extraction, so coal mining, for example, and, and production of electricity using coal, and life, uh, livestock, poultry, dairy, and fish. Why uh, this uh, sector? Because what we did was to assess uh, what what should be the changes in the economies in the region that, that should happen in order to have this, carboniz this decarbonization pathway. And the, the main changes in the economic scenario is to change uh, energy and go for clean energy and to change our diets and go for a more plant-based diet. Uh, in terms of employment, if you go to the left-hand side, uh, to the blue picture, you have, uh, I mean, which are the winners of, of, this, uh, of this shift uh, towards a green economy. You have Brazil, Mexico, the Andean community uh, with, with different numbers. You have 7 million for Brazil, 2 million New Yorks for Mexico. For the Andean community, you have 1.5 million and, and you have other, other, uh, other uh, numbers there. I will, send, I will put the link in the, in the text uh, right after I finish the presentation, so no, no need to be worried about the numbers. But what do we have here? We have that one out of every two jobs in Latin America and the Caribbean are informal jobs. So they, this is something that, uh, that it's very important for us uh, in, the, in the region for the world work and uh, in order to create, I mean, to have the possibility to, to increase decent work uh, in, the, in the region, we need to address informality. And the same deficits uh, that we see in decent work conditions, uh, we are, are, are making the region more vulnerable uh, to climate change and more recently to COVID. So you, if, if you read the news from Latin America and the Caribbean, you will see that are those sectors where informality is higher, are the sectors where more people are dying, more people are, are getting ill, more people simply don't have any more, any more jobs and they need to move to other places or to find other options. Uh, so that's why we believe in the in the region that we need to have a very central uh, space for informality uh, in the in this on all this just transition kind of thinking and, and policy making. Uh, well, you the the graphic in the right hand side is the impact of uh, increasing temperature 
in the working conditions. So uh, this is the number of jobs that will be destroyed because of that impact, because of uh, temperatures raising too much. Um, simply, it's, it is impossible for workers in agriculture, in the in, in cleaning our cities, in, 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 in some other sectors uh, to keep working. So those jobs, uh, there will be many hours, uh, working hours that will be lost. And this is, a, this is the number that you have. It's, it's increasing very much in 10 years time, uh, 2030. And this is something very important that we believe should be at the center of social uh, justice. If we want to, uh, to promote social justice through just transition, we need uh, to pay attention to gender equity. Why is that? Uh, because in, uh, you remember, we said that there will be uh, the potential to create 15 new jobs in the region. Okay, if you go to the left-hand side graphic, you will see that 80% of those uh, uh, 15 new jobs uh, will be accessed by men. And only 20% of the new jobs will be accessed by women. Okay, so for us, uh, this is a very kind of graphic element that uh, where you see that we need uh, to put in place uh, very ambitious uh, gender equity policies uh, if we want to have any options to reduce uh, the gap, the existing gap in, the, in a green future. So since the very beginning, the ILO has been saying that we may have a green economy future, but if you don't put, the put in place labor and other type of social policies, it will be not be just or fair for all. And this is a very good example. Um, and another, another uh, piece of information that we have included, we have a little bit uh, do the sum up of the number of jobs that are now um, linked to the just transition sectors. So energy, waste, transport, uh, some, type, some type of manufacturing, tourism and, and a few others. And that represent in the region 78 million people working in those sectors. Okay, it's a little bit less than uh, half of the total employed. And most, many of them, uh, 56 million are men and uh, 22 million are women. This is the reason why in the future, if everything goes uh, business as usual, we will have a much uh, bigger gender gap that uh, we have now in the world work. So uh, what's happening in the region, the transition in the region? There are a few countries who have already started uh, to, to, to work in projects or initiative or thinking, or some of them, I mean, the, the approach is very different from country to country, and I have included a few of them here, just for information. Uh, Costa Rica, uh, this is uh, one of the first countries that reacted uh, to this issue of just transition, and uh, in 2018 already included just transition as one of the pillar of their decarbonization plan. Uh, they are now uh, discussing about how to include uh, this issue of just transition within their NDC uh, review uh, process, and we are uh, very gladly supporting them in doing that. Mexico City, uh, since uh, almost the new government started to, to, to run the, the city uh, last year, 2019, uh, they started to have this Green Jobs program, which is your, the, the image of the right hand side. Uh, they are, I mean, the government, what, what they are doing is to, to put together environmental objectives and uh, labor market objectives and trying to come up with joint solutions. And uh, yeah, they are doing training, they are doing temporal uh, working arrangement for, for, for some, uh, uh, some parts of the labor market, vulnerable groups and things like that. And, and they, I mean, the type of work that they are doing is growing. In Colombia, last year, uh, November last year, we signed ILO and the Ministry of Labor, the Green Jobs and Just Transition Pact. Um, we are now working, uh, working with them, with the Ministry of Labor, to put in place uh, the, some, some, some uh, initiative uh, related to this pact. Uh, which include something related to social dialogue, something related uh, uh, to a green jobs assessment, and some other issues. Uh, Colombia, if you read the news, it's a very relevant country for just transition in the region because they are right now having a, 
and strike uh, and strike of uh, coal mining in El Cerro. And, and it, this is very important. And this is kind of part of the what is needed. No, they need alternative jobs. They need other jobs because coal simply is going to disappear from from the country. I mean, sooner or later. Argentina uh, working quite a lot in on uh, lately on this issue of uh, just transition and social dialogue, especially uh, just transition and green jobs, especially since the new government took uh, took uh, office. Um, Guyana as well. I, I think I will go a little bit faster because I think yeah, my time is about to finish. Let me also say that Chile is one of the countries uh, that uh, it, it, it is more advanced as well, together with Costa Rica on this issue of just transition, because they already agreed uh, to phase out coal from the electricity uh, mix. So it is, if, if you want to, to know a little bit more, there are like many uh, information in the web. And this is the last, uh, the, sli the last slide. Uh, so some ideas, no, for action for uh, green and fair recovery. Uh, first of all, I already mentioned formalizing business and workers, uh, focusing on the sectors that are more important for just transition, construction, transport, energy, food, agriculture, etc. Uh, green jobs creation through public employment programs, which will be very interesting for. Uh, providing uh, some uh, income opportunities for the most vulnerable, migrants and others. And, and you can do things like reforestation and, and maritime coastal uh, conservation programs. Need to pay attention to safety and health because of COVID and because of uh, raising temperatures. So it is, it is uh, very important. Also, green sectors normally have a reduced uh, rate of accidents and professional illness. So it is, it, it's interesting to, to see the green jobs also as safer uh, jobs. We need training, this is fundamental and the most important, uh, the most important uh, bottleneck that we have seen in, in all the countries where we are working. We need new certification and adaptation of existing curricula. Social dialogue, of course, uh, well, my two previous presenters uh, have already mentioned that, the importance of having workers, communities, business, etc., cetera, uh, as part of the discussion. Um, and also, if we want to promote social justice, we have to promote access to vulnerable workers, women, youth, rural economies. There are different vulnerable workers in different I mean, uh, geographical contexts. And finally, we need to put in place policies to develop the industrial uh, change, I mean, the industrial supply chain link to the, the sectors that I have mentioned. Otherwise, it will be difficult really to create the 15 new jobs that uh, I mentioned at the very beginning. So yeah, thanks very much. This is the my uh, my last slide and let me... Thank you so, very much. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you very much, Anna, uh, for this really comprehensive overview of what's going on in Latin America and the Caribbean. I think it kind of helps us to uh, see a couple of these like policy approaches and numbers associated with just transition um, to kind of collect our thoughts around the different elements that we've heard. But before we move into the uh, Q&A session, I'd like to hand over to our discussant, Nora Retzel, who is a professor of sociology at uh, Umer University. Nora, the floor is yours to kind yeah. of give us some of your uh, ideas and reflections on what you've heard. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think generally we are on the same page. So I thought that my... Um, task is to uh, be a little bit critical to everything, also to myself in that case. So I've been working with um, labor movements, based mainly trade unions and environmental issues since 2006 or seven, something like that. And one of the problems that we found in our research is that um, in the, in the industrial workers' world, the question of nature and the relationship of their work to the way in which it affects the destruction of nature doesn't really exist as an experience. And uh, that makes it very difficult for trade unions in the industrial sector, especially in the global north and in the global south, to think about 
why it, it would be necessary to um, give up their jobs or to change their jobs and to change their production system. So while just transition is a way of overcoming the conflict between um, saving jobs and saving the environment, you know, and uh, in a lot of the just transition this discussion, we say this uh, either or doesn't exist. It's only both or nothing. Yeah, but when you then look at the empirical places, there is this conflict. There are the trade unionists who are pressed by their bases. We want to keep our jobs. We want to keep the jobs we have now because what does it mean if somebody uh, promises us that we can have other jobs as good jobs in the future? You know? So the question to everybody is how can you um, overcome and transgress the conflict that exists in the everyday of trade union and work, work about this conflict between, I want to keep my job and uh, yeah, nature is somewhere, climate change, yeah, we see it more and yeah, yeah, I have to protect that, but I need my job, okay? So I think uh, theoretically, of course, there is no such either or, but practically in the everyday life, I think there is. So the question is how to do that. Another question in the just transition <clears throat> discussion when I read uh, trade union um, documents, you know, um, especially in Europe. Um, I sometimes, or I not sometimes, I, I guess I always get the impression that it's very much about protecting your standard, okay? Even if we have to change our jobs, even if we have to get other jobs, they have to be as good have to have the same salary, you know, um, and the same working conditions as I have now as a coal worker or as an oil worker, for instance, which have very good working conditions. And um, although that is totally understandable, the question is, is that possible if we look at it globally? You know, Anna has just showed us all the impacts that uh, the destruction of the environment has, uh, and because it's specially experienced in the global south. And it's just not, it's not only carbon, it's not just the climate crisis, it's also the destruction of biodiversity, which then leads to us getting viruses. You know, there is a relationship, a strong relationship between the destruction of the environment and COVID. Although we tend to say, okay, here is the climate crisis, here is COVID, and we have to talk about both things. No, it's the same thing. They're both the result of the destruction of nature. And that, I think, can be experienced much better by workers in the global south and workers who are directly working with nature in agriculture, small workers, small farmers, and so on. But how do we connect then and relate to each other the interests of the workers in the global north to keep their standard and the necess necessary um, relationship that has to be drawn between that standard and the value chains the destruction that happens by creating jobs in the, in the North that have a good standard. And this is also true for renewables, you know, because all the minerals we need for renewable energy production is extraction in the global South under horrible working conditions. Okay, I'm not gonna go more into that. Then Damien. Uh, it's difficult to ask a question to Damien because he's asking all these questions himself all the time and very fantastic and uh, interesting and necessary questions. So um, when you talk about labor and design and how to create design in a way that uh, it is um, related to labor, who is the actor? Who are the actors? in this process of relating design and labor. Yeah. 
And um, finally, um, what I think, I have already said that, but I want to say that um, again um, in order by finishing up. Um, I think the just transition debate has to broaden and include issues of biodiversity, the sea, um, monocultures and all that in order not to remain um, a concept that thinks that it has achieved its goal if it just protects workers who are working in the energy sector, more or less, you know, get the energy workers from fossil fuel to renewable and that's it. I think we have to be broader and also we have to be broader in questioning the role of work in society. And I hear I want to connect a little bit also to the degrowth movement, whatever one might think critically about them. But it is really the question, especially in the global north, do we need to work all that time and produce all that stuff, destroying all that environment? Or do we need to think about a reduction of paid work and another way of life? And how does that go into just transition? Thank you. Nora, thank you so much uh, for these uh, questions. I think they're super relevant and critical. Um, and I would suggest that while I sort through uh, the questions that we received in the Q&A box, I would uh, give the floor to our panelists for one quick round of maybe one minute um, of reflections and reactions to your most critical questions of how can we overcome the real life kind of conflicts that exists between nature and work and how do we overcome this kind of battle between protecting standards in one place and exploiting workers in another place. And I suggest that we might just go in the same order uh, for ease of reference of Eduard, Damien, and then Anna with a quick round of reflections. And then I'll ask some questions that we received by the audience. Yes, uh, thanks. Um... I mean, I think those are very, very important and, and, and relevant uh, points. And I think you, you're you right to kind of insist to highlight some of the contradictions or some of the shortfalls, I guess, of, uh, of, of, of some of the debates uh, around just transition. Um, I guess you seem to focus a lot on the kind of labor movement. Um, I feel that I think that's one of the things that we tried to do with the with the Just Transition Research Collaborative is to actually also broaden our, our view by also including in our thinking um, um, just transition efforts or efforts that framed or that, that, that presented themselves as just transition efforts that were not necessarily uh, um, um, union union led. Um, so, I mean, some of the examples that we focused on were, uh, for instance, Corporation Jackson in, in Mississippi in the US which are actually more kind of community-based uh, uh, movements. And I guess the, the reason I refer to that example in particular is that I think that the issue of um, um, the kind of broader reflection about, you know, not just, uh, um, you know, keeping my job or keeping a standard of living, I think that when you look at the efforts and the kind of just transition kind of framings and discussions that they have, it is actually more than just that. It is actually also about, uh, rethinking of the urban environment, for instance, through the development of uh, urban agriculture. So thinking of uh, uh, um, rethinking as well, like uh, uh, fo refocusing as well on uh, um, how uh, uh, local communities function uh, uh, through the establishment of kind of cooperatives, through uh, more cooperation as well at the local level. So kind of a more spatial, I guess, approach as well to the just transition issue. Um, and so I, I feel that maybe, you know, I think that I think that's also why the just transition concept can also be actually interesting in a way is that there are also those uh, different approaches to the concept, which uh, I think could potentially feed, uh, feed, feed off each other. And maybe my last point, and I'm slightly over my one minute, but I think it's also important to highlight that um, sometimes we mustn't also fall into kind of a false conflict, you know, by by, by focusing so much on um, co-workers who want to keep their their wages or their standard of living, et cetera, et cetera, I think we mustn't uh, um, 
we mustn't forget that uh, uh, on average uh, um, uh, workers, uh, um, regardless of their country, have a minute responsibility uh, in terms of carbon uh, emissions. I mean, their, their, their carbon footprint is, is, is minimal when compared to uh, uh, um, the richest uh, uh, in the world. And so, you know, I think it's also important to keep that in mind. And I think the, the Oxfam, I think it was Oxfam that just published a new report kind of showed this very clearly. Uh, um, um, because otherwise the risk is also obviously of confrontation amongst workers, of kind of pitting one group of workers in the global north against one group of workers in the global south, when in fact, on average, both groups have a minimal responsibility and their carbon footprint is minute, again, when compared to uh, the richest uh, 5% of the, of the world's population. Okay, thanks very much, Nora, for your very uh, provocative questions, hard questions to answer. Um, I suppose I would say that um, I'm not entirely convinced that the word nature helps us in any way when we're trying to think about people's distance and inability to really see biophysical um, transformations and their impacts. You know, it seems to me that that, that, that that obsession with nature comes from an older moment of environmentalism. And that one of the things that the Just Transition could do is encourage um, us to see the amount of labor that has existed in our landscapes and our foodscapes and our um, agriculture and um, the, 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 the atmosphere more generally. And when we look at the, the race class, and when we start to understand the environmental histories of the race class and gendered labor that, that continually is involved in making these worlds, then much more interesting questions can be, can start to emerge, a politics of food, a politics of gardening, a politics of uh, transportation, of um, you know supplying the, the 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 social and ecological things that we need to exist, which are which are not part of that older romantic tradition of saving nature with a capital N, which, which always ex worked on a binary from the beginning and excluded many people from um, an understanding of the web of life and our immersion immersing in within it um and then i suppose in terms of you know the agenda of um you know i mean are there real tensions between jobs and the environment and you know is there a danger of skating over that i suppose you know i wonder how much the just transition should be focused on fossil fuel workers and their futures they are increasingly of a small a shrinking part of uh, of um most um work workforces and employment sectors care work and many other areas are becoming far more important for the multiracial working class in many areas and it seems to me that some of these tensions whilst some of these workers are certainly remunerated very uh, extensively in some areas they are also experiencing some of the degrading contexts of a neoliberalized welfare state and the stripping out of provisions since the 1970s and that creates possibilities for talking about you know a, a broader politics which is focused on green industrial policy which is focused on green public goods which is focused on you know re a return of planning for the public good which is um, trying to think about new strategies that trade unions might deploy like solidarity across the supply chains um, it might invo involve us rethinking the welfare states to envisage a kind of a low carbon green public welfare state which can address workers beyond a kind of a narrow social identity that they get from just um, the workplace so so I mean I think this would be the the terrain that I would want to explore and then on renewables I want, would similarly want to explore the ways in which renewables can be designed in hugely exploitative ways with exploitative material flows but they can also be designed in ways which could offer all kinds of co-benefits so that solar can offer shade it can be designed in ways that allow for agriculture it can be designed to give um, you know financing and um, wealth back to communities as Eduardo mentions with Operation Jackson so there are different 
I think the, the, the point I would make is that there are many different ways of configuring our socio-ecological relationships, and we need to engage in the politics of that and refuse a kind of singular account of where it is heading. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Damien. Uh, Anna, maybe in your reflection, could you already try and address the first two questions that were addressed to you in the chat box and that you flagged as you would like to answer them? Can you hear me like that or should I use those? Can you hear me like that? Yeah, I don't know. I think they are not working and I'm keep using them. <laughs> so yeah, it, I mean, I'm, I mean, we have to take into account that I'm working uh, in specific initiative and specific projects with specific governments and specific unions and specific employers. So maybe the point of view that I have is a little bit more uh, related to the different context where I'm working in Chile is different than Colombia, different to Costa Rica, very different to Mexico, and of course, very different to Barbados, for example. So something that I've seen is that this issue of just transition, as it is at the, at the ILO guidelines, applies to very different type of uh, political context. So in, for example, just to give you an example in Jamaica, there is this idea about blue jobs and how to formalize fishers communities uh, and with the idea of creating new jobs in, uh, in, in, in protecting the maritime environment and things like that. So this is for Jamaica. <laughs> Sorry about that. This is the problem of being uh, at a family setting. Um, but I mean, if, if you go to, to other countries like uh, Mexico, they will be very interested in working waste management and recycling, which is not directly related to climate change, for example. And still they are applying the just transition guidelines because it includes many areas that are very important for them, like, like again, formalizing, which is a big issue, uh, creating, uh, creating cooperatives or entrepreneurs or things like that, uh, providing uh, skills and, and adapting the uh, skill settings. Uh, and if you go to the other countries that I have mentioned, Uruguay, for example, and Argentina, they will be working on other type of, uh, of, of issues. Like in Argentina, they now very interested in the tourism sector and how to make it more resilient to COVID and things like that. And the same kind of uh, approach is very much needed, is social dialogue and participation. And, and it's about uh, uh, listening to what uh, the others have to say. So in relation to the question that uh, Nashma uh, was, uh, was uh, asking me, hi Nashma. Um, uh, what I have seen is that there is a growing interest in, in, in participating on the, on the policy debates on climate change, on NDCs, and on some other issues. But there is, I mean, I'm talking about the trade unions, for example, uh, because normally the private sector is it's, uh, very much aware of and, and very much taking part of all these processes. Uh, but, uh, but, but they need to understand what, what the country is talking about, because they have been keeping apart from this type of discussions for a long period of time, and, uh, and, and, and they need to understand better w w what's going on. Uh, including with the terminology, what is an NDC, what is the long-term climate policy and things like that. What they say is that there is a strike in the north part of the country and they need a solution to that. And if just transition is something that could be uh, helping them to do it, I mean, go for it. But uh, so um, responding to him, to her, yes, there is a growing interest, but we need uh, to tailor a little bit to the different uh, context of the country where you are working or where we are working. And, and the second question about uh, women, why we know this 80, 20% male uh, women access is because if you follow a business as usual kind of pathway and, and, and you see what, where the jobs of these uh, just transition uh, sectors, economic sectors, uh, how I distribute it in, in terms of gender division. Uh, again, remember energy, construction, transport, agriculture, all those, forestry, uh, fisheries. We already have this division between men and, 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 uh, and women. Uh, so if we go 10 years later and, and we understand there will be a growth in, in green business in, in those sectors that I have mentioned, normally this pathway will, will follow uh, the current uh, kind of male women uh, domination by sector. 
and we will have uh, this division of labor with more, more men uh, access uh, green jobs than, uh, than women. So 80% versus 20. Thank you so much, Anna. Now, we won't have time to really listen to many more questions, but I want to at least pose one to each of our panelists. Uh, there were two questions to Nora, actually. One on whether the absence of nature in workers' world is rooted in ontologies shared by the working class. Um, that might also be a point that you want to respond to Damien on. And uh, one on whether the solidarity between workers in the North and South is currently a missing factor and could address the disjuncture between the standards and livelihoods focus of just transition, saying that global solidarity can be a powerful force of change. Um, while you answer those, can I ask the other speakers to take a look at the question and maybe also already type some answers for the ones that are easily answered in a few words? Thank you. Yeah, sorry that I um, express myself in a way that that uh, uh, provoked misunderstanding. I didn't talk about nature, you know, like this other nice thing that we have to protect over there in order to have a good time when we walk through the woods. But I was exactly discussing the labor nature relationship, you know, thinking of the old, it is old, I'm old, so we can be old also and connect the old and the new. Um, the old um, word by Marx when he criticized the, um, the socialist um, uh, program and said labor is not the source of all goods and all wealth, it's labor together with nature. And the reason why I insist of this relationship and the workings within them and, you know, labor always being in nature and through nature and the other way around is because, and I insist on this industrial working class because there, there are thousands of them. And of course, it's much more, um, what do I say, um, rewarding to think about community, to think about gardening, to think about all these things. But what about 25% of all the workers in the world are industrial workers? You know, it's not only in the North, it's also in the South. We cannot just get rid of 25% of the working class or forget them. So my question is always about relating. So relating these 25% to the service, which is as much and to agriculture, which is the other part. And that means relating community work, garden work, um, uh, subsistence farmers, and uh, all the workers, informal workers that Anna has talked about to those industrial workers, because it is not so easy to create that relationship. And to answer the question, it is because the working class, at least in the global, North, and I would say also the industrial worker class in the global south, for, have forgotten the fact that they are constantly transforming nature and nature is transforming them. You know, think about not only the, the workers in the, in the fossil fuel, but also all the outer workers and so on. So I think it is really crucial to find practices uh, to create, to, to make um, conscious that that relationship exists all the time. Nature is not out there, it's always within the production process, any kind of production process. And um, the question about, what was the other question? I'll be very brief then with the second question. I forgot. Uh, the question uh, was about the solidarity between workers the and the North House. Yeah, I mean, that's actually the other, the other way of putting what I want to talk about, about this connection the North-South solidarity is necessary and it's very difficult, but it's going to be dealt with, I think, in the other section, which is about North-South. So I'm not talking about that. But I want to say one more thing about renewables. It's not about only how you use them, but how you produce them. In order to produce renewables, you have to extract the, an, an enormous amount of minerals under the worst working conditions and we don't have enough of these minerals in order to shift 
the amount of energy that we use to renewable energies because we just don't have the material to produce so many renewable energies, uh, uh, energy um, machines. And that's why we have to think about reducing work, reducing consumption and all those things. Thank you, Nora. So we're really out of time now, but if you allow us to run just five minutes over, we'll get uh, at least two more answers from uh, Edouard and Damien, because there's really a lot of questions and we hope also we'll dig deeper into some of the points that were raised by our audience uh, in the coming sessions. So, um, Edouard, there was one uh, question on the just transition concept and its origins in the labor movement, and that saying the international trade union movement has been at the center of negotiations around the development of international just transition declarations, Paris agreements, Alicia, etc. But to what degree are trade unions actually prepared as prefigurative organizations to help facilitate the type of radical social and environmental change needed for truly transformative just transition, post-carbon slash post-capitalist? Are they really capable of moving beyond the eco-modernist green capital paradigm? And then it if it follows a question for Damien that he can maybe address himself right after you speak. Yeah, um, thanks. I mean, it's a, yeah, it's a great question. Um, uh, I mean, I, I think it's an open question, I would say. I mean, I, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily, um, 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 I wouldn't necessarily say that they can't uh, potentially uh, carry these types of discourses because, you know, having uh, observed discussions and debates within the international trade union movement, I, I, I know that some groups are, you know, carrying this kind of more uh, uh, um, um, post-carbon, post-capitalist uh, discourse. I, I guess what I what I would say, however, is and then what I was really surprised by, um, um, you know, again, having observed quite closely, you know, the internal debates within the movement, uh, uh, it's that it's, it, I think uh, NGOs and other groups involved in the climate movement would actually have a lot to learn from the labor movement in terms of how it's organized and how decisions are built. Uh, um, I find that the debates and discussions within it uh, uh, around these issues were uh, sometimes uh, um, slow, were sometimes not moving at the, at the pace that was required, but at the same time, at the end of the day, once a decision was taken, uh, uh, everyone adhered to it. And I think, so in terms of the organizational structure, and the organizational culture, I would say that the labor movement actually does have a lot to teach others. Uh, um, and, and, and I feel that that could also potentially form the basis for uh, a more kind of radical positions and change. Thank you, Edouard. Damien, please be really brief. I know it's really an brief. impossible question to answer in a minute, but. <laughs> yeah, um, so I think um, the question of prefigurative um, radical prefigurative politics answer the question and Nora's emphasis on um, you know culture change more generally are absolutely necessary and vital and I suppose I would just finish by giving a plug to uh, Kate Soper's latest book um, Post Growth Living um, I think it's a, an interesting question of how you frame these questions so if you frame them in terms of less I feel we will get nowhere whereas Kate Soper argues if we frame these possibilities for post um, growth and post carbon living in terms of alternative hedonisms and new ways to experience pleasure and possibility, then we might have more possibilities to gain popular support. So I, I would, um, you know, leave that there and say, let's prefigure in ways that are meaningful to people that aren't just trying to tell them what to do or announce new forms of green austerity. Let's, um, let's focus on, you know, the, the possibilities that could emerge from post carbon living. And that would complement our concerns, I think. Thank you so much, Damien. Uh, I think also, I want to thank uh, all of the speakers again, uh, also Rosa Luxemburg Foundation for the support, but also all of the uh, participants. I think we will take some of the questions that you put forward uh, with us also in the reflections for the following sessions. Um, I would like to just announce that the next webinar will take place next Wednesday uh, in the morning, and we will put the link to the, in, uh, to the registration in the follow-up message that all of you will receive, um, also with the link to the recording. If you could all just kind of uh, fill in the form for which you have the link in the chat box, that would help us greatly. 
uh, thank you very much for attending, for stimulating our conversation, and we hope to see you throughout our series. Thank you, everybody.